Good evening, everybody. My name is Mike Frank. I'm the director of Hoover's Washington, D.C. office. And welcome to Pizza, Pints, and Policy in that order. Well, maybe Pints, Pizza, and Policy might be better. So I'm going to turn it over to Adam Klein, but we have a great panel tonight, wonderful topic. And please do me a favor, if you're not on any kind of a mailing list for this, if you just heard about it, please make sure before you go, get on the mailing list. We're going to be do these, doing these periodically with the Conservative Reform Network. And uh, always open to ideas and suggestions for future events. So Adam, take it over. It's all yours. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, and thank you to Hoover for hosting. This is a collaboration of Hoover, CRN, the Conservative Reform Network, and Renew, which is kind of like the little sibling of the Conservative Reform Network. So for those of you who are under, let's say, 50 uh, young <laughs> reform-minded conservatives who are interested in following these issues, uh, please sign up for Renew's mailing list, and we'll be happy to loop you into all of our future events in this series. Uh, so we have a fantastic panel today. Given that this is a pizza, pints, and policy event, uh, I'm not going to belabor everything with long introductions. I think you all came to see them, so we'll get right to it. Um, Ramesh Panuru, uh, again, needs no introduction, senior editor for National Review, columnist for Bloomberg, fellow at AEI, and many other achievements too numerous to list here. Uh, Jonah Goldberg, also of NR, you all know him, of course, columnist for the LA Times, dog aficionado, uh, and author of various New York Times bestsellers, including most recently Liberal Fascism. And then Todd Lindbergh, a research fellow here at Hoover, writes widely on U.S. foreign policy, a true Renaissance man, also writes on various philosophical and historical topics. Uh, his most recent book is The Heroic Heart, which studies changing notions of heroism and how those changing notions are connected to broader societal changes. And I hope that's something we can touch on today. Uh, so with that, I think we should get started. Uh, and I'm sure all of you have read or are at least familiar with the debate in the pages of National Review and National Review Online about nationalism, whether it's good for America. Is it a force that unifies us? Is it a corrosive force? Uh, we're not going to uh, reenact the entire debate here. Uh, instead, I thought it would make sense to start with the key question. What is at the core of this debate? Is it merely semantic? Or is there a functional disagreement that has real significance? Uh, so I'd like to start with Ramesh and Jonah, who are on opposite sides of this debate in National Review and in NRO. Uh, is this a semantic debate about the difference between nationalism and patriotism? Or is there something concrete that Ramesh, you and Rich Lowry would support that Jonah opposes? And if so, what is that concrete core of the disagreement? Yeah, Ramesh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 I'm going to leave it to Jonah to defend his, his lack of patriotism. Um, lack of nationalism. Uh, <laughs> That's right. I, I got uh, it backwards, but go on. Uh, the, we did spend a lot of time in all of this back and forth talking about the meaning of terms, um, which I think is actually important because nationalism is a topic that um, combines strong emotions with imprecise definitions, and uh, people will are using the same word in different ways. Um, sometimes they have an underlying substantive agreement, that, but they think they disagree. Um, and uh, it's important to, to clarify these terms. Um, but I do think that underneath the semantic differences, there are some, some significant real differences. One of them is basically how we should regard President Trump's nationalism. Um, should we regard it as entirely a kind of distortion of a legitimate and healthy conservatism, or as something that combines um, both good and bad innovations within conservatism, which is, which is the way I would think of it myself. Um, I would argue that Trump, uh, Trump rose in conservative and Republican politics in part because of a failure on the part of other conservatives and Republicans to tap into what's right about nationalism, to espouse a kind of healthy and legitimate nationalism. Um, and I think that those of us who want to have a conservative, uh, a conservatism that's independent of Trump and of the Trump administration need to learn from that and not simply reject nationalism out of hand, uh, but try to temper it, try to leaven it, try to lead it in more constructive directions. But back to your definition of nationalism. How does it differ from Jonah's patriotism? What is, the, what is the gap between those two, if any? Well, or is Jonah's, it just semantics? Jonah's very confused. So, <laughs> so it's, 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 it's hard to, to, to pin him down long enough to, to figure out 
of exactly what this difference is. Um, lots of reasons you can't pin me down. <laughs> I would say, the, uh, look, uh, obviously, you know, people can use these terms in, in different legitimate ways. L the way I've thought about patriotism versus nationalism is patriotism is, a, is simply a love for your country and for your fellow countrymen, whereas nationalism is, the po is a political expression of patriotic sentiments. It is a political philosophy or program that places a lot of emphasis on the uh, nation's interests, its sovereignty, and its cohesion. Um, I think that if you start with that orientation, there are a number of possible implications that follow from it. For example, immigration is a topic where traditionally I've been on, on more restrictionist, um, the more restrictionist side of that argument than Jonah, and I think that that maps pretty closely onto this division. That's great. Jonah, you've been, you've been jabbed at twice already, so I think it's fair to give you a chance to respond. Oh, but my score is like four times. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, where to begin on this? I, look, I think Ramesh is absolutely right that um, absent the context of Trump, this would be largely a semantic and philosophical disagreement about the right terms um, to describe these things. And uh, my first complaint about the, the piece that Rich and Ramesh did was that um, in the context of the Trump administration, uh, coming to a rallying defense of nationalism would be seen, stipulated mostly by people who will never bother to read the piece, um, as lending aid and comfort to uh, Bannonism or Trumpism or their versions of nationalism. Um, I have never said and I think I said in my response to it um, that I'm anti-nationalism. I think that nationalism, that a, li uh, a little nationalism is vital. But as with almost all things, uh, the, the poison is determined in the dose. Okay. And, um, could I follow up on that? Yeah. Uh, I liked the phrase that you used in your piece, that, that it's a uh, pre-rational passion. And you accept in the piece that we need some dose of that pre-rational passion to create a strong allegiance to the state, to bind us to one another. Uh, but how do we notch the slippery slope once we accept the necessity of that passion to prevent it from becoming too great, to yeah. prevent us from falling all the way down? I, I, I always want to flip the safety on my rifle when I hear people analogize countries to families. but. So I will limit it to a certain extent. But um, I think there is a useful comparison there. Don't tweet that. We are all, <laughs> we are all born into a family with a pre-rational commitment to our family, yeah. right? That is something that was hardwired into us. We know that from neuroscience. We know that from common sense. We know that from, you know, pick your philosopher. Um, but then what a family does, what good parents do, is they civilize their children to sort of higher principles rather than just sort of rote allegiance. And I think th that distinction is where you get the distinction from nationalism and patriotism. Every country in the world has nationalism. Nationalism is a pre-rational passion. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a glorified form of tribalism. Um, even before the Westphalian system, you had nationalisms and you certainly had tribalisms. Uh, what made America different is that it turned a it turned a very specific corner. It, it, it embraced an Enlightenment notion that um, which harkened back to ancient notions of, of republicanism um, that said that America is different. We're trying something different here, and that we are not necessarily just another tribe of Europe, uh, elite, you know, pledging allegiance to a king. We're a tribe of citizens. We're 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 a country of citizens. Um, pledging allegiance to certain ideals and principles. And, um, and so again, I think just as in a family you need that, or in a marriage, you need a certain amount of physical attraction um, before you can get to the higher reasons for why you pick a soulmate for the rest of your life. Um, you need, in a country, you need a certain amount of pre-rational passion about this country is mine, it is mine before it is anybody else's, or it's, it's, it's uh, for any other place, you have an attachment to it. But then you have to take that and you have to build on that and, 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 and convince people to have commitments to um, something higher and something better. And I think that the, I mean, the biggest problem with 
the way we talk about nationalism today is that the person who supposedly symbolizes this new national nationalistic impulse in American life and the, is so wildly ill-equipped to discuss it intelligently. And I'm, of course, referring to the President of the United States. Um, and uh, normally presidents, even the most nationalistic ones, have the ability to merge notions of patriotism to their nationalism. I mean, I, I am, I think, the, 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 the North American chairman of the International Order of Woodrow Wilson haters. And yet, um, uh, he even managed, in all of the, even in his worst speeches, to get a little bit of, of, of what makes America special into his stuff. Um, Donald Trump has, is utterly um, uh, lacking in any fluency, uh, when he's off a teleprompter at least, of talking about liberty, freedom, constitution, any of these sorts of higher notions of what make American patriotism different than running of mill nationalism. And so one of the problems I had with, with, with what Ramesh was doing was that in a, Ramesh and Rich were doing, was that in another context, I thought that the essay was entirely defensible on the merits. Um, I had some disagreements with it. But in the context of, you know, right around the time of Donald Trump's inaugural, which I gather was better than the original German, um, <laughs> to uh, lend aid, aid and comfort to what a political movement was calling nationalism in America, I thought was ill-advised. And that's sort of how I come down on it. So one thread that kind of runs through that answer is this question, what is the American nation? What is it that we are supposed to be, be attached to as patriots, as nationalists even? Uh, what is it that we are supposed to feel this, this pre-rational passion for? Many would argue, and this is also a long-standing cliche, that America is the only country based on an idea rather than an ethnicity. Or to put it in more uh, uh, academic terms, there's this concept of constitutional patriotism propounded by the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas. Now that you've all had one beer, I think it's okay to start bringing German philosophers into it. Uh, and that idea is that, and I quote, Political attachment should center on the norms, values, and procedures of a liberal democratic constitution. Uh, and so my question is, is America an idea? Uh, if so, what is that idea? And are the norms, values, and procedures of our liberal democratic constitution thick enough to sustain the type of bonds of nationhood that we're talking about here, or does it have to be something more? Todd, I'd like to throw that to you. Well, uh, you know, I think the United States of America is both a uh, an idea and a country, and I don't want to get weasel out of this by having it both ways. I actually think that, frankly, Ramesh and Jonah are in pretty much violent agreement on the basic uh, question that's underlying here. What, what Jonah doesn't like is uh, the backdrop, uh, the context. Uh, he, th he thinks this is giving too much credit to something. And Ramesh, I think, is trying to get a little bit ahead of it uh, in the sense of, uh, is there something here that, that can be positive? and is trying to make a case that there is something to be positive. Uh, you know, the, uh, I've been thinking about this, having, having read their articles and the other responses to it, and it's quite, uh, quite interesting. You know, uh, to me, nationalism uh, is different from patriotism, and that patriotism uh, presupposes a state. Uh, it, it, uh, you, you have to have a country in order to be patriotic, whereas nationalism, you don't actually need uh, the country. It can be about your national aspirations, your, the desire of a people to have a state, uh, self-determination, these kinds of things, which have been historically very important in the, in the course of this idea. And, uh, and those, too, are motivated by ideas. So it's not as if there's, a, there's an American monopoly on that. Uh, but, but the liberal aspect of it, I mean, in the classical liberal sense, uh, liberty, uh, is, I think, something that has its, it, its origin in world politics with the establishment of the United States, and this is different. Uh, I think other countries now share that aspiration, and you're right about Habermas. Uh, but, uh, but, but we were kind of out front on this one, and that is the source of our sense of exceptionalism. And I, you know, I, I'm, my view, I, I think, is, is you know, when we're talking about, well, you know, Ramesh is going to come out kind of pro-nationalist, and, and, and Joan will be kind of uh, an anti-nationalist. And I figured, well, I'm kind of anti-anti-nationalist. So that, that'll perfectly square the, uh, the, the obtuseness. And as I wish, we're actually fundamentally in, in, in agreement on all the, basic, all the basic points here. No, obviously, nationalism is dangerous if it gets unmoored from uh, principles that are good and virtuous. And uh, this is this. We, we don't need 
we don't need to study a great deal of history in order to know this. It's pretty much as plain as the 20th century uh, right before, behind us. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, uh, you need, uh, states need more than just sort of um, Weberian bureaucracies uh, to uh, uh, maintain themselves, uh, even if you don't like Weber very much. Uh, you need a um, you need an idea of, of of a nation, and this this one this country does provide that, and uh, the 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 national and the national aspiration, uh, the nationalist aspiration. I think you can say, Jonah, and I, I uh, it, it, uh, behind "Make America Great Again," uh, is really quite transparent, uh, and it's not um, I think a hard thing to understand, nor do I think is it, is, it's at all a bad thing. Now, you could you might say, well, it's a, it's a little nostalgic. It yearns for a past that was, A, not really as, as described, and B, you know, had its own imperfections, et cetera. But it does say, you know, uh, we have this aspiration. So what is the aspiration other than the ideals that I think we all know and learned as school children? Yeah, well, I, I, what that, is that what, what is what is the thing the, that defines us other than our founding documents and the ideals expressed therein? I would say also our you know our history and and the fact that um, whatever you, if you look at if you look at the Declaration of Independence it's uh, independence you know it's it says uh, um, all are created equal uh, I left out a word uh, but you know that's the point uh, it's, it did say all men and now we understand that to mean something different and the way you get from there to here uh, is by overcoming these. Uh, these hurdles that are that, that come up in the way, uh, and that's I think uh, th that's important to the American sense of self. It acknowledges uh, high aspiration and imper imperfection, and uh, at the same time, and the, it, 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 in a way, the country is is always in a state of becoming. It it, it hasn't simply been. Yeah, I, I just want to add one quick thing about this. I mean, I I I agree with much of that, um, and if we want to change this slightly to. Uh, patriotism versus populism, we will be in uh, uh, more violent disagreement and not just violent agreement because I think populism is pretty terrible. But, um, you know, America has a culture. American people are, um, you know, as Bill Murray might say, we're not Watusis. And um, you always tell who's seen the stripes. And, um, uh, you know, Seymour Martin Lipset, who uh, was, you know, the past died a few years ago, but he was the president of both the American Political Science Association and the American Sociological Association, which I didn't think you could, it's like being the head of both Crips and Bloods, but um, uh, he did something which I didn't think most sane people would ever try to do, which is study Canada. And, um, and he always made this point, which I always thought was quite brilliant. You know, conservatives love to do this uh, controlled experiment point about North Korea versus South Korea or West Germany versus East Germany and point to the differences. And he says the greatest, he said the greatest controlled experiment of the last, you know, 200 years was in North America. Because in the, in the, around the time of the founding, if you are the revolution, if you were a loyalist or a royalist, you either stayed in Canada or you moved there. If you were, as Tommy Lee Jones says in Firebirds, someone who had your head and your heart wired together for some full tilt boogie for freedom and justice, you moved to the 13 colonies and you fought off the British. And so you have the exact same genetic stock, more or less. You have the exact same cultural stock, more or less. But you have two different peoples who have self-sorted based upon a proposition. And so you fast forward, you know, a couple centuries, and in the 1970s, almost at the exact same time, the United States and Canada both told their citizens that they were switching to the metric system. And the Canadians, who have been raised for generations to take orders from the throne, um, said, okay, and started driving kilometers and weighing things and, you know, in grams and other witchcraft. And, and Americans just sort of laughed and said, we're not doing that. And we stayed with inches and miles and all the, the measurements that God intended. And, um, and that's, that gets to the heart, one of the hearts of, of, of the difference between American culture and the culture of almost the rest of the world with maybe Australia accepted. And that is, um, and to a certain extent, you know, I mean, Canada is better than a lot of other countries, but that's... Really let, let, it, let it be recorded. Yeah. Canada uh, is better than a lot of other countries. Yes. Yeah. So, 
this day. Um, but we have in America uh, this cultural thing about uh, the sovereignty of the individual, about not taking <coughs> orders from the state. And, um, uh, and so one of my problems with nationalism is, is that it becomes very difficult to disaggregate from populism when translated into the political arena. And the logic of populism is to, to bowl over, to, uh, to iron out, to, to whatever the right metaphor is, that natural American tendency of asserting our individuality to be part of the giant glorious we. And the great thing about America is that we're not normally, except in times of war, um, people who are great joiners in mass mobs for political action. And um, I don't like rhetoric or ideas that aim themselves towards that. Um, and patriotism doesn't, because inherent in patriotism and the logic of patriotism is there are only certain specific moments where we should drop everything that we're doing, drop our individual pursuits, and rally around the state for big causes. Um, and nationalism says no, all wars got to pull together at all times. And um, uh, and I think that that is a, is a dangerous move, for con particularly for conservatism, which is supposed to be conserving something, um, to sort of play those games. By all means, let's have nationalism. But, and I hate to be Straussian, let's try to call it patriotism because that might make it more patriotic and inculcate in people a certain understanding of what those ideals and principles are supposed to be. Let me uh, jump back in here. It, it, I mean, we've all said in different ways that American nationhood has a kind of ideological or an ideas-based component. Um, and I think that does differentiate it from the nationalisms of other societies, although it doesn't differentiate it from every other nationalism that has ever existed since we have had ideologically defined nations in the past, like revolutionary France or the Soviet Union. Um, we, what, what I'm suggesting is that this kind of uh, fusion of a culture and a set of ideas that together combine to make our nationalism um, is something that it has to be kept in balance and that you can easily go too far in one direction or the other. And it does seem to me that from Reagan onward, American conservatives overemphasized the abstract ideas and increasingly did that. Uh, and that is one of the things that led to a Trumpist reaction that, to my mind, doesn't emphasize the ideals enough. Um, and so Part of what I'm suggesting is that in, uh, to, to borrow Yuval Levin's, uh, the title of his, his book from last year, In Our Fractured Republic, um, that a sense of solidarity, of, of national belonging, is actually something that the people want, desire, and legitimately value, and that we should honor, uh, and not simply say, um, no, you know, we're a bunch of Randian individualists, um, all making ourselves up uh, according to our own individual myth. Um, so part of the disagreement here is what needs to be corrected. And it seems to me that there's a kind of Trumpian populism that needs to be corrected, but there's also a pre-Trumpian conservatism that led to it that needs to be corrected. Well, now I think there's something that Jonah can disagree with. <laughs> uh, because I, you know, when you say things like, um, uh, the wrong turn really occurred under Reagan, uh, I mean, that's generally some fighting words uh, around here, um, and and it's interesting. It happened under Hoover. Ah. <laughs> yeah, you know, Hoover, Hoover, Hoover. If, if Hoover it was if, William of Ockham, if, if Hoover had not become president of the United States, he would have gone down as one of the greatest humanitarians of the 20th century. That sure. was his, his mistake was running for office. For you you forgot where we are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> now, uh, no, I you know I, th I guess what you're saying in a way, Ramesh, is that when conservatism became classically liberal. Uh, in under Reagan, which I think is true, uh, that something important was lost. Uh, and that would be the kind of cultural side of things. And that, and that does indeed connect, I think, a little bit with, uh, with nationalism more than patriotism. Uh, you know, whatever happened to George Will? No, that's the too complicated a question. Uh, whatever happened to uh, the statecraft, the soulcraft uh, conservatism of George Will? Uh, or... Um, Everybody got uh, very excited uh, during the during the 1980s about the wealth of nations, and nobody was particularly excited about Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments, uh, which has to be read alongside um, 
uh, wealth of nations in order for the latter to be understood properly. So I think there, you know, I, I think you're onto something. I, I think there was a there, there was a there was a loss when uh, when conservative. And not by the way, I'm not I'm not saying that you know what's going on now is the answer to it. That's a, uh, but it but I do think in a way it is a response. So uh, arguably another name for the new nationalism that we're seeing today <coughs> is Jacksonianism. And it's uh, for the first time in a while we have a, a Jacksonian president in the White House. And uh, foreign policy is a big part of that, a big part of that change. Arguably, uh, interventionist foreign policy and the ba Jacksonian backlash to it was a big reason for Trump's success in the primaries. He went straight into the teeth of the Iraq War and the South Carolina debate and lived to tell the tale and indeed succeeded. Uh, so I guess the question is, how significant is Jacksonian foreign policy as a political uh, weapon? Uh, how significant was interventionist foreign policy in the demise of the traditional cosmopolitan urbanized Republican elite? Uh, and do you think that issue has staying power? I think this is, this is a very big deal. Um, you know, the thing to understand, uh, the Jacksonian, of course, is, is not just a reference to President Jackson. It also was a reference to Walter Russell Mead's analysis of the, of the four elements uh, uh, of, of American po uh, foreign policy and the ways in which they variously combine. Uh, with the Jacksonian nationalism uh, in his telling of it was best exemplified by the guy riding uh, a Harley in Rolling Thunder on Memorial Day who'd fought in the Vietnam War. Uh, it was this, and, and felt, by the way, um, that his country screwed him over. Not that he doesn't love his country any less, but, but that, that sense. Uh, it's, you know, Jacksonianism is not uh, anti-intervention. In fact, it's in general in favor of kicking ass. Uh, but uh, it wants to be sure that the people who are in charge of doing that kicking actually get the kicking done and get it done properly. Uh, and... Uh, you know, I, th I think there's a, that's a huge element out there. And, and when you think about, uh, I, I th 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 no, go ahead. Yeah. Can I push back on that a little bit? Mm -hmm. uh, so this idea that they're not against intervention. Uh, maybe we should peel that apart. They're not against intervention perhaps for some reasons, but for many others they are. So we have an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, I think it was last week, by uh, Gary Cohn and H.R. McMaster saying that we engage with the world, and it was titled America First, by the way, mm -hmm. we engage with the world not to impose our way of life, but to secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. Uh, so the question is, what role do values play, and isn't that the key cleavage between Jacksonian nationalism in the foreign policy realm and this, the interventionism of the Republic? Yeah, but you know, I, I, in fact, I think you know, it's become increasing. I've been trying to do some writing about this, but I, it's clear that we've been through a period of, shall we say, liberal overreach. Uh, and that this has an, uh, an international component to it as well, and obviously Exhibit A is the Iraq War. Uh, not so much uh, the, on grounds of uh, the need to do something about what turned out to be Saddam's uh, uh, non-existent weapons of mass destruction, but if you were wandered around Washington in 2002 and 2003 and talked to serious foreign policy people, uh, there was a kind of unanimous consensus that uh, following the toppling of the Saddam regime, uh, the United States owed uh, Iraqis a, a better government, a liberal government if possible, a democratic government, and there was a general sense that this was, a, 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 though it would be a challenge, that it was an achievable goal. And uh, I think that consensus is, 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 is exactly about the, you, the extension of, our, of, this, of this basic sort of liberal principle, classically, again, classically liberal principles, uh, to, uh, to an area where it wasn't prepared to go. Uh, and it couldn't practically go. And I, there are other examples of this. I'd say the International Criminal Court is an example of that. But, but think about how John Bolton described his opposition to the International Criminal Court. He was worried about a rogue... Uh, international institution, colossus, bestalking the world, snatching up perpetrators of, of this and that and hauling them, you know, to quote justice, unquote, at The Hague. Whereas actually the International Criminal Court is a mouse. It can't get anything done. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, one could go on with examples of this, uh, but in a way, it's, it's exactly this kind of the way in which the world uh, has uh, uh, responded, not in accordance with these frankly, as well, Reaganite um, uh, values of, uh, of, of liberal internationalism, uh, but has rather started to push back uh, in, in a fairly big way. And uh, so if you're not going to be able to uh, achieve uh, the end of history by uh, 
uh, by you know 2050 or so, then you maybe have to start thinking about um, how you need to retailor some of these, uh, not just the arguments, uh, although certainly the arguments, but also the, the thinking that underlies them. There, it is not the case that within every heart there is a liberal, uh, in a classical sense, uh, trying to get out. Uh, and we should not act as if that is true because it will cause us a lot of trouble. And that, in a way, I think is, is, the, is, is, is an element of the, of the often unarticulated Jacksonian frustration uh, that, that's, that's out there. Yeah, it, it does seem to me that um, a lot of what we are seeing is, is a continued reaction to the excesses of uh, the George W. Bush administration. I mean, if you think about the second inaugural um, where he really enunciated this doctrine where of, uh, of a very sort of muscular foreign policy behind the spread of American values. Um, I think what is, re I think because of the Iraq experience and to a lesser degree Afghanistan, Americans at both the popular and elite level are, are tired of that. They think that we went too far and Trump is a reaction. Obama in a different way, but Trump is also a reaction to that. And I think what has replaced that kind of foreign policy is not a doctrine, but an impulse, right? Jacksonianism, I think, is best understood as an impulse, not a doctrine. And it certainly found its champion in an impulsive man. Um, but what he has talked about is not simply isolationism, right? I mean, he talks about going to other countries and seizing their oil. It's not an isolationist uh, <laughs> impulse. Um, it is the idea is that we've we've gone too far in pursuit of these airy values, um, and we need to think uh, much more about our hard-headed interests. I think that it's an over-correction, um, but I do think that some move in that direction made sense. Interesting, though, that all, many of these same voters voted Republican for decades while crusading internationalism was the dominant strain of foreign policy thinking in the Republican Party, perhaps because that was the only strain I, of American greatness. I, I, well, I, I, no, 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 we had a pretty good run with that, actually. I mean, Central and Eastern Europe are in a much better position than if we had reached this conclusion back then and said, yeah, let's no, not bother trying in that space. Not commenting on the I, outcome. I, I talked to one of um, President Bush's aides at the, in the second administration, who, second term, excuse me, who said uh, to me, um, you know, people misunderstand this. Republican voters don't like Bush because of the Iraq war. They like the Iraq war because of Bush. And I think that we over, a lot of people overestimated how much foreign policy views drove voter sentiment. Uh, I think that there are, there are, some, there are some issues where, that voters feel very passionately about and that drive their behavior in voting. Um, but then there are others that don't. Trade. We've seen Republican views on trade turn on a dime because so many Republicans decided, well, we're for Trump now. Uh, and you can look at that over the span of three years. Is free trade a good thing or a bad thing? And I think these foreign policy doctrines and should we be global leaders or should we look out for our own interests, that stuff is the commitment of voters to either side of that debate is just tissue thin. Because so I, 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 I was getting a little frustrated with this conversation for a bit there. Um, say I agree with entirely with Ramesh's last point here. Um, there is this tendency, we're so desperate, in, particularly in Washington, for to find doctrines and systems and, and, and theories that fit the moment. And so everyone is sort of trying to push onto Donald Trump some master explanation of what he is doing. There isn't one. Um, it's sort of like you know, and the gods must be crazy, where everyone tries to, they, they, guy gets hit in the head with a Coke bottle and thinks it must be the will of the god. You could put two envelopes with diametrically opposed policy positions in Donald Trump's desk and have him flip a coin and whichever one, he pick, opens that one, this is going to be my policy today. And a lot of my colleagues at Fox News, a lot of the sort of people who yell at me all day on Twitter would support it if he opened the other envelope. My colleagues at Fox News and, and people who yell at me on Twitter would support that. Um, we are in a moment of, I think politics is often more of a cult of personality than we are willing to acknowledge, but we are in a particularly acute moment of a cult of personality when it comes to Donald Trump. Donald Trump bombed Syria, and with the exception of uh, Ann Coulter, of all people, 
um, there wasn't a single prominent Trump supporter I can remember who had any problem with it. If he hadn't bombed Syria, all the people who celebrated it wouldn't have had any problem with that either. Um, I agree entirely with this idea that there's a Jacksonian, the Walter Russell Mead argument that there's a Jacksonian tendency in American politics, but the Jacksonian tendency, which I would argue is nationalist, fit well with the higher tendency of serious foreign policy conservatives who had wanted to put, whether you want to call it neoconservative or not, it, it, it coincided with it very well for a lot of the 20th century. Um, and you could have, you know, there was the arguments about rollback versus containment. Um, the, you know, the, during the early parts of the Iraq War, some of our writers at National Review were part of what um, I think it was Rich called the um, rubble doesn't make trouble school of foreign policy. And then other people were sort of for the democracy promo promotion part of it. But when things are going well, yeah, democracy promotion is fine. Um, when things start going south, that's when the two things start to go apart. And, um, uh, and so I, I, I think that people voted for Donald Trump in much the same way that they voted for Barack Obama, because a, lot, a sufficient number of them liked him a lot. They were charismatic personalities in the Weberian sense of the people projected upon them, the meanings that they wanted to find in them. And now they reverse engineer their positions based upon what, what Trump does. And it works both ways. Free trade is more popular among liberals than it's ever been because Donald Trump is against it. Um, immigration is more popular among Democrats than it's ever been because Donald Trump is against it. One of the biggest problems with what Trump is doing in Europe is he's making NATO unpopular with Europeans because Donald, or, because, or at least contributing to NATO unpopular with Europeans because Donald Trump wants them to do that. Um, some supposedly sane writer in England, I saw a clip of it today, um, had this, uh, T Toby uh, Harden uh, tweeted an excerpt of it, had this a piece where he said, sure, I don't like Jeremy Corbyn's Stalinism. I'm not a big fan of his fellow traveling with Hamas. Um, I really think that his you know, uh, push for allowing ISIS fighters back into England is misguided, but you know, he wouldn't be out there saying good words about Donald Trump like Theresa May is. You have to be higher than a moon bat to think that like Jeremy Corbyn, two days after a terrorist attack, should be the next prime minister of England because Theresa May has to, as prime minister, be somewhat accommodating of the president of the United States. But this is a global phenomenon now. If, if Trump is for something, lots of people are against it and lots of people are for it and it can change on a dime. I think we've got time for one more issue. Uh, and since trade came up a few times in that last exchange, let's talk about economic nationalism as opposed to political nationalism. Uh, Ramesh, your piece with Rich noted the tension between nationalism and free market conservatism, especially on trade. Uh, how can we reconcile this? Is, and is there any way to reconcile this? Uh, yeah. Well, look, I think, I think uh, look, I'm a free trader and not one of those free traders, but. Uh, I do think that people who support free trade can sometimes approach this issue in a kind of utopian way uh, or too abstract a way or they can, they can make it sound uh, a little bit dogmatic. Look, if, if somebody could identify me t for me a departure from free trade that would actually serve the interests of American workers, I'm all ears. The, the problem is that what people are actually talking about, you know, 35% across the board tariffs on um, all products from poor countries, for example, which is one of the ideas that, that Trump briefly discussed, that it's clearly a terrible idea um, for the American economy. Um, but I think that that's what the argument has to be. The problem isn't the nationalism there. The problem is that it doesn't actually serve the national interest. So we have to confine ourselves to the instrumental arguments for trade rather than the rights-based or philosophical arguments for trade. Well, yeah. I mean, I think actually that the, uh, the philosophical arguments for trade that usually get made are kind of overdone. Like this, the argument that sort of free trade will promote peace, for example. Like the, the, by the time you put it, all the relevant caveats on that argument, it's just practically not all that important. Um, I think there's a, a great many good things to be said for trade, but the things that we should be saying about them are practical things. Right, let me just push back on that very quickly. I think this is the weakest part of the, you know, 
would you say you're one and a half cheers, two cheers for nationalism? How many cheers do you have for nationalism? I'll give two. Okay. Um, uh, nationalism, when it actually gets applied to public policy, um, particularly economic policy, is very hard historically to distinguish from socialism. Um, whenever we've, whenever, you know, read any speech by Fidel Castro or Hugo Chavez, you can go in and you can replace the word nationalist with socialist and socialist with nationalist and you don't change the meaning of any of the sentences. Uh, nationalized healthcare is socialized medicine. And when you start down the road of touting nationalism mm. as a expression of the popular will and doing what's best for us first, politicians have a very good way of, make, of turning that into statism, protectionism, and, and, and all the rest. When Barack, Barack Obama was the last guy to call for economic patriotism and, um, or economic nationalism, and what he meant was greater control by the state because the state is the only legitimate arbiter of the, the people's will. And um, that's not what America is supposed to be about. And the more oxygen you give this nationalism as the authentic voice of the American people, the more it leads you towards status policies. Where is a place where we've embraced nationalism that has led us to more free market domestic policies? Withdrawing from the Paris court? I represent the citizens of Pittsburgh, not the citizens of Paris, and therefore I'm not going to impose these kinds of energy restrictions. Okay, that's, a pure, that's a national that's sentiment. That's fair. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Where about making actual domestic policy? That's a foreign policy thing, right? I mean, about economic policy. I would say the Reagan economic program was linked to a rhetoric of national renaissance and greatness. It used nationalist sentiments to uh, push a deregulatory tax cutting and government limiting agenda. We'll, have, we'll continue that part of the argument mm -hmm. later. I, mean, I think maybe we could argue that China has actually pursued a nationalist growth agenda through free market means, but the challenge is that they don't have to answer to the voters. And it is very hard to persuade voters that national greatness is served through economic liberalization, including trade with foreigners. Uh, maybe that's a, a communications challenge that those of us who support trade uh, have yet to overcome. Mm. Uh, April uh, is giving me the, the, no? Yeah, I just think questions. If Great, let's go to questions, okay. okay. James Spiller, no useful affiliation. Um, I think of the difference of nationalism and patriotism being that one loves country and one loves nation. Uh, that nation is often bigger, so re German nationalism is about Great Germany, uh, Soviet, Russian nationalism about, is about the Soviet Union, or smaller, so the uh, Basque nationalism or the Scottish nationalism aren't about the country, though, about the, the cultural group. And that American nationalism has historically been smaller than the country. It's excluded Catholics, it's excluded Jews. The, the Klan was the biggest national. It, that doesn't seem to be the distinction which you guys are making. Do, do you guys believe that nationalism is about a different group to patriotism, a different we? Mm -hmm. or, or do you believe it's the same? Great question. What is the American we? Yeah, I think I, I, this gets to the heart of my problem with nationalism. Nationalism in the American context tends to be synonymous, more synonymous with populism than it does with patriotism. And populism always claims to speak for the people, but the definition of the people is always smaller than the actual population of the country. It has to define itself against traitors, outsiders, problematic people who are against the people, and um, patriotism doesn't have that language to is it. Is it too controversial to say that the we is the present citizenry of the United States? But that's not who Donald Trump's we not, is. I'm no, no, but I, it, it, is, it is my we, and it actually, I mean, there, we got a critique from the Niskanen Center where they were arguing why, what's so great about being a citizen of the United States? Why shouldn't we um, treat an enterprising person um, who's not an American uh, on the same plane, and why should we privilege the welfare of people who happen to be citizens of this country? That's just an accident of birth or an accident of, of migration. Yeah, but that's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, right? I mean, we can agree that's just wrong, right? I mean, uh, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah okay. <laughs> right. no, I'm but, with but, you, by the way. But I think it's but I think it's important to remind ourselves that there is something to citizenship that that we do have obligations to our fellow Americans. Yeah, that we don't it, have it, other sort of, I, I think there's a kind of an inclusive we uh, to the American sense of patriotism. Uh, generally speaking, it has been about broadening. Uh, I agree with that, but it, I don't think to the American sense of nationalism. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, you know, the, the, there, there is, there is that you know. We, we are we, and you are someone else, right. uh, and that's you know that's that's interesting, and and and, it's a, and potentially quite serious. Michael Paul Perzicki, a, 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 
owls strategies um on on trade it, it, uh, do you see any 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 hint of 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 na nationalist sentiment in some of the uh, the the center the center left are uh, left are arguments made in favor of t of t t t t t t t t t t t t t EPP, i.e., if we don't, if we don't write the rules, a China will. Yeah. Is that a geopolitical argument? Well, right. I mean, it is, it is a geopolitical argument about the national interest, which is sort of like the, the way most of our democratic debates end up being conducted. You know, just one additional point on the on protectionism. Um, in practice, I think that you end up having policies, if you go down a protectionist route, that benefit special interests at, at the expense of the country as a whole. Uh, and I think we're already seeing that, that, we, that traditionally when we depart from free trade in this country, it is for the benefit of interests like the steel industry, even though there are a lot more people who work for the steel using industries and you end up actually hurting our manufacturers uh, and so forth. Um, and so th and that's part of what I have in mind when I say well, like our, tr our true economic nationalism would not necessarily be protectionist. Now, I'll also say, you know, Bernie Sanders has these interesting bits of sort of small and small s national socialism to him. You know, he hates the Niskanen view on immigration um, or the. He used to before he ran for president. Before he ran for president, yeah. he had these great interviews where he say, "Oh no, that's a Koch brothers thing. He just wanted to get all these." You know these cheap workers and ruin our you know workers, and there's there's something that I mean there's something fascinating in his bizarre fetishization of Scandinavia that I think you could only get as a Brooklyn Jewish transport to Vermont, um, where you're around only sort of sort of white cold climate people, and you think that like this is the way you're supposed to run things as little so socialist republics. And there's the, but there's this weird echo of that kind of nationalism in this stuff, particularly prior to um, him running for president and had to and buy into all the identity politics stuff. Hi, uh, Hilt Root, uh, George Mason University, f formerly a senior fellow at, at Hoover up until ten years ago. Um, so I have I see two things missing in in this conversation. One is uh, nationalism being part of a global trend that that has affected many countries uh not only democratic countries but 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 all kinds of countries authoritarian countries european countries asian countries uh and secondly um nationalism as a response to or triggered by uh, uh, risks uh of globalization to uh not only identity but 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 simply to to people's security and and, and a feeling that Global institutions uh, haven't really and don't offer much uh, solace or certainty, and therefore a retreat to to national ones. Piggybacking on that, uh, bringing up the international dimension mm -hmm. here, I want to ask Ramesh a question mm -hmm. uh, in that vein, which I previewed to you earlier. Mm -hmm. If you were, say, a conservative intellectual writing in France or any of the other countries in Europe that have seen an upsurge in nationalism, or Turkey, mm -hmm. or Russia. Would you feel the same way? Would you feel that nationalism <coughs> is a benign and uh, positive, generally positive force uh, if you were in a country that was rooted, unlike the United States, in a specific ethnic and cultural heritage? So I'm behind the veil of ignorance, yes. but, uh, but I'm going to imagine myself to still be a sensible person in these, uh, in these other countries. Look, I, 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 think, uh, I think that I would still think that nationalism is a potentially constructive force and a potentially destructive force, like many other natural passions that, uh, that human beings have, sexual desire being another one which can take more and less uh, uh, constructive and orderly forms. Um, I think that uh, go on. I would, <laughs> I would favor. Um, uh, you know, look, I, I I would favor an inclusive sense of nationalism that in, that incorporates all the people who are within a society uh, and tries to 
promote a shared sense of belonging. Yeah, that's a very liberal conception yeah. of nationalism. I mean, it's, it's, there's no danger yeah. here. Uh, no, I think it's a really terrific idea that the Germans, for example, have suppressed many uh, instances of uh, speech in Germany that are associated with the, with the old regime there. And, um, and you probably agree with that, I would, I, I'm thinking. And I don't want, I don't want that back. And, uh, and Austria is a, little, uh, is, is not, is, is a scary place uh, right now. Uh, because there is not that kind of uh, sense uh, in, as exists in Germany of a, uh, a past that has been reckoned with, uh, dealt with honestly, uh, made up for to the extent possible, uh, and uh, continues to animate uh, life in Germany today. Uh, and you know, I, so I, I think don't I, I don't want you to get too pluralist with your okay. defense. I, I think you're well, me, I think you're better off with a defense of American but nationalism. Let me, let me put it this way, though, Todd. I I'm a moderate restrictionist on immigration in the United States. In a different country with a different culture, I might be more of a restrictionist because I think the United States has a greater absorptive capacity um, than a lot of other countries do. Yeah. yeah. Um, just to get back to the the, uh, the original question. Um, you know, maybe it's because I'm deep in the weeds of this endless book I'm trying to write. But um, I think the re one of the reasons why uh, we're seeing this sort of populism, nationalism going up all over the world is because, um, in part, globalism has been fantastic for huge swaths of the extremely poor around the world over the last 40 years. But it's come at a legitimate expense of at least at perceived legitimate expense of, of middle class Western um, middle uh, citizens. And, uh, and, but all around the world, I think the sort of the global order is losing partly because of discrediting that certain regimes um, have been playing, but the global order, democracy, liberal democratic capitalism aren't delivering the goods the way they once were. Now, reasons why that's happening or reasons why that perception is out there in advanced countries or semi-advanced countries is a, outside my pay grade. But when that happens, you know, capitalism is unnatural. Liberal democracy is to a certain extent unnatural. Tribalism and nationalism are very natural. And I think that when times seem insecure, institutions are not serving people, Particularly in the United States, one of the reasons why I think we've had this flight to nationalism, populism, and uh, is because our mediating institutions and in civil society is being so hollowed out. The family is being so hollowed out. And as Robert Nisbet put it in the quest for community, we have this innate desire to be part of something. And if we can't find, if the quest for community cannot be satisfied through local institutions of faith, family, church. Uh, you know, uh, the Kiwanis and whatever those things that used to be around us, in front of us, we don't stop seeking community, we start seeking for it elsewhere. And there are people who are selling meaning to people in forms of nationalism and populism and tribalism of one kind or another. It benefits certain regimes a great deal um, to sell this bill of goods to people. Um, and the job for, I think, li the liberal democratic West is to double down on trying to deliver the goods. I mean, economic growth would help enormously. Pushing democratic power down to the most local level possible to make people feel more empowered in their own lives would help enormously. Doing something about the breakdown of the family, at least in America, would help enormously. Um, but the same forces that made the life of Julia attractive for Obama voters Make, make, make America great again, and we're going to win, win, win attractive to Trump voters. There is this sense that people are not getting what they need from this society and this economy, and they don't stop seeking it. They seek whoever's selling it. And that is a model that is being replicated around the world in different ways, and it poses real challenges. Uh, David Beckworth, the Mercatus Center. Following up your observation, Joan, about economic growth going to the masses. I wonder to what extent um, this is rise of populism, nationalism can be traced back to the Great Recession. It hit both Europe, hit both the U.S., an anemic recovery, also a lot of government intervention that maybe people point to and they see. Uh, the economist Doug Irwin says that typically after steep recessions, there's a natural pushback against trade. 
Ross Perot in the early 90s. Mm. So I wonder, in, in your view, to what extent can some of this be attributed to the Great Recession, both in Europe and in the U.S., and, and the slow recovery coming out of it? Yeah, there, there was, was the Journal of European Politics. Someone did this great analysis about the uh, rise of populist movements after um, uh, particularly financial crises, right? Or rece deep recessions or um, depressions caused by financial crises, which are different politically in some ways and, and for other ways and economically than other kinds of economic corrections. And they found there's a remarkably long tail to them. And you can go back to William Jennings Bryan. You know, um, I think that there is this sense, particularly with financial crises, that, oh, it's those manipulators on Wall Street, or, you know, there was that ad that Bannon put together towards the end of the campaign that, you know, pointed to all of these sort of very Jewy kind of, you know, manipulators and string pullers, part of the global elite who are manipulating our lives and taking over, you know, uh, running, running things for us. That kind of thing um, uh, has happened a lot in American politics, and know-nothings and all the rest. Um, but I think it happens more because of financial crises, precisely because people have a hard time understanding it. It's like a paper phenomenon, and the middlemen all seem to make money, even though everyone else loses their mortgage and suffers, and so they feel like they've been conned. And I think there is, I think there is definitely something there. Uh, Stanley Cobra, no affiliation. In a letter to Lafayette in August of 1786, George Washington described himself as, quote, a citizen of the great republic of humanity at large. How do you reconcile Washington's statement with your conception of American nationalism? Should add an even more uh, suspicion-inducing founding era quote. Thomas Jefferson said, every man has two nations, his own in France. <laughs> I'm much more comfortable criticizing Jefferson than Washington, so. Mm -hmm. Well, well, you know, I, uh, everything has a, a particular context, a grounding. You know, you, you don't start um, as a uh, citizen of the world. You start as a, you were born in a particular place. It has certain characteristics. Uh, you pick them up. You learn these things. Uh, and then you start thinking about it. And you think, well, maybe there is something that connects people across tribal lines, et cetera. And maybe there are actually broader principles that may be to some degree true of uh, humanity uh, in a larger sense. Maybe it's, maybe, it, maybe it's not anything more complicated than that you were created in the image of God. Uh, maybe it is uh, the product of the philosophical mind, Kant, thinking alone. Uh, maybe it is just uh, coming in contact and touching um, humanity uh, in, in a way that was not particularly common uh, many, many years ago, but was really beginning to become imaginable at about the time of that quotation. Uh, so I don't find it especially difficult to think uh, that you can be, uh, uh, you can have this sense of, uh, uh, of nationalism as a, as a kind of uh, aspiration, while at the same time uh, harboring uh, a broader vision, uh, uh, an idea I would say, uh, as uh, that quote speaks to, uh, you know, a classically liberal vision, which is uh, at least in principle, uh, though certainly not in fact anytime soon, applicable uh, to the broader category of people as a whole. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me, I think that's exactly right. Um, I, I, I have a hard time imagining that George Wall, I don't know the context of the quote, I'm sure it's an accurate quote, but I just... I, 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 I have a real hard time seeing George Washington as the American Diogenes, seeing himself merely as a citizen of the world, given that he had just killed a whole bunch of British people to give birth to a new nation um, in, in North America. So he had to have reconciled this to some extent. At the same time, he was an inheritor of this Declaration of the Rights of Man kind of thinking that comes out of the Enlightenment. And... Um, you know, one of my one of my conservative heroes is Albert J. Nock, who really couldn't figure out why you should make a big deal about living in America or Belgium, mm -hmm. Belgium, which to me is like fighting words. But um, <laughs> uh, I, I think that uh, you can have this sunny-facing attitude towards other countries and the world, 
and still love your own country and protect, want to protect your own country and defend you know, this constitution that you know, he did chair the Constitutional Convention, so he kind of had some buy-in on that, too. But, I mean, not just the Declaration of Human Rights. Think about the Declaration of Independence, right? We, we, we think of right. how our founding era was trying to make the case to the world that it was possible to have a government that was, that was built on principles of reflection and choice, not just accident and force. Um, why does the rest of the world matter? Why does it matter that you're showing that to all of humanity? It's because there are universally valid moral principles that apply to all people, even if they have to be realized in history. And I do think that an aspiration towards universal liberty and equality <coughs> is part of the American DNA. But what makes, you know, what, what makes American nationhood interesting and productive is that it is... Also, it's instantiated in a particular culture, people, and history. So I worked for Justice Scalia, and so I think that you should always uh, come back to the founders in the end. Uh, so with that, uh, please thank our panelists.